the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by His authority. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God, our Maker and Redeemer, you have made us a new company of priests to bear witness to the gospel. Enable us to be faithful to our calling to make known your promises to all the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. The one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. On this fourth Sunday after Pentecost 2022, the word comes to us from St. Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, the impact of the Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In our Gospel lesson this morning, our Lord Christ sends out 72 preachers on ahead of them. 
They're being sent out not with their own message. Jesus doesn't say, hey, give the world your best thoughts. No, they're not being sent out with that, and they're not being sent out with their own opinions. But instead, Jesus specifically tells them, heal the sick and proclaim that the kingdom of God has arrived. He concludes by instructing them, and this is important for us here in the church especially, the one who hears you, hears me. Jesus was giving them authority, authority to make his word known to that small part of the world. In a sense, they're pathfinders. They're going on ahead of Jesus as he is on his way to Jerusalem and the cross. And of course, they go and they do just as Jesus tells them, tells them to do, and they preach Jesus' words, the words that he gives to them. It's his word. They preach it. And when they come back, they come back to Jesus with joy and I suspect all sorts of amazement. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In other words, this is amazing. And it is amazing. Don't ever take the gospel for granted. It's amazing. Don't lose that excitement and fire for God's word, Christians. Don't grow complacent with it. Many of you know, I was, maybe like a lot of you, maybe some of you, I was not raised in the church. I was taken to baptism as an infant, and only occasionally I went to vacation Bible school. And you can see why a vacation Bible school is so important. Because for a kid like me, that was the only church I ever had connection to. Occasionally went to Christmas services, but so few that I, I hardly remember. We didn't read the Bible at home. <laughs> we had a Bible, but we didn't read it. And we certainly didn't pray or sing hymns at home. We didn't do those kinds of Christian things at home. The faith was largely absent for me growing up. And when I was 15, my father came home late one night. I think it was probably a Friday night. It was after a long night of drinking. And he woke us all up. We had this, this family conference at 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever, and, which we had from time to time. And he made the announcement that we're all going to church on Sunday. We're all going to church on Sunday. It's kind of a, that's a heck of a way to get an a, a invitation to church, right? But we got an invitation to church from my dad, no matter if it was 3.30 in the morning, whatever. So we went. And it was awkward. It was awkward the first time going to church. It was, it was so foreign. But over time, after just a few weeks, it started to subside quickly. It started to get into the routine of what church was on Sunday morning. And it was a small church that we went to. It wasn't much larger than this one. But it was in that church, that small church, that the gospel of Jesus Christ came into my ears and changed everything for me. Change the trajectory of my life. I understand. I'm, we're, I'm giving you some personal testimony right now. I'm being a little bit of a Methodist right now. And that's, that's okay, okay? Yeah. The gospel hit home with me with such force that the world began to look different for me at age 15 and 16. My life was never the same after the impact of the gospel in that tiny church. I remember, and I've shared this with you before, sitting in that church just looking over my shoulder for Jesus to come down that center aisle. That's how much of an impact the gospel made in my life. And I want to tell you something about that, that tiny church. It had no flashy youth group. It didn't. It didn't have a cool band or singers. It didn't have an indoor jungle gym. All it had was an old organ, old wooden pews, a pulpit, and a communion table that was so infrequently used it had dust on it. All it had in that tiny church was a preacher who week in and week out handed over the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that, in that small old church, I heard the gospel and things were never the same for me again. That's the kind of impact the gospel of Jesus Christ makes in our lives. Now here's my fear. 
Here's my fear. We who have been in the church for a while, I've been in the church for a while, most of you have been in the church for a while, we who have been in the church for a while can often take for granted this impact the gospel of Jesus Christ makes in lives, makes in people's lives. My fear is that we lose our sense of enchantment with the gospel. My fear is that we take it for granted. That the gospel is everywhere. We just assume it's everywhere and it's heard by everyone. I'm here to report to you this morning, it is not. The gospel of Jesus Christ is actually a rare thing. It's a gem that once you get a hold of it, you can't but let go of it. You want that gospel in your ears. You hold on to it for dear life. Now what I'm about to tell you, I wish... I wish I could go into details for you, but I can't. This past year, 2022, I've seen for myself what kind of impact the gospel makes in people's lives. I've seen the reactions. The first time that it happened this year in 2022 it was outside of the church. I shared the gospel with some people. With, I just gave it to them. I let it fly, right? Your sins are forgiven in Christ. He is risen and alive. And I I was surprised at the reactions. I was surprised at the reactions that, that people, and they weren't angry, believe me. They were grateful. Then later this year, again, outside of the church, I, I happened to be talking. I, I delivered the gospel. I just let it fly again. And I saw the impact of the gospel on people again. It was like, in these, in these moments that I've experienced this past year, it's like giving water to someone who's dying of thirst. In those moments, I, I like to think I kind of understood how those returning disciples felt when they came back to Jesus and said, like, this is amazing. They came back with joy. I get it. How does this all happen? How does this all happen? The word of the Lord, as Hebrews describes it in the New Testament, is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword, it penetrates. So there's one way of looking at it. The other is the prophet Isaiah. We can go back to the Old Testament. The word of the Lord never returns empty. Never returns empty. So what does that mean? Well, in terms of God's law, what does it do to us? Because God's word comes to us in two words. Law and gospel, in terms of God's law, it convicts us. Pick a commandment. Examine yourselves. Maybe you heard the sixth commandment and you were convicted with that. Examine yourselves in the light of the commandments and go through them all and see where you stand. You can try to ignore them. You can try to pretend they don't exist. You can do all you can to silence the law of God by saying they don't apply anymore. And they will still always successfully accuse you and me. We know this in our hearts. There's something not right about the human condition. We watch the news and we know it. We examine our own lives and we know this about ourselves. In this, the law of God gives us a blessed death, as Martin Luther describes it. It kills any bit of us that still thinks that we can make things right in the world or with God, or that we have some sort of potential to change things with God or in the world on our own. Only in this painful yet necessary look in the mirror of the law do we start to see ourselves in such a way that we're finally able to hear the gospel. And it's to this end that God is still sending preachers bearing the gospel out into the world. He is still sending them under his authority. Now this is announced every week in the divine service. Just moments ago you heard it. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and what's next? By his authority, and then what? I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. 
to people like you and me who were once lost and trapped in sin and on the path of death, the impact of this unconditional promise of Jesus, it's huge. It's huge. I can see it in your faces after I announce it. Even after I announce it, I feel better. It rearranges things. It it turns things upside down. It, It sets forth a new path for us going forward after Jesus. Because why? The gospel is the power of salvation to all who believe. Romans chapter 1. Because of that then, because it's the power of salvation to all who believe, because this promise comes into our ears and we come to believe and confess that Jesus is Lord, we want it all the time. You don't want it just once or occasionally. No, we say, give me the gospel always. Put it in my ears always. Keep it in my ears, dear Lord. It's amazing to be forgiven and freed from sin, death, and the devil. Because to have that then is to look upon the friendly face of Jesus. It's Jesus for you. And with Jesus for you then, sin, death, the devil, they don't have anything over you. Never again. Man, that's that's freedom. Having the gospel, which is the voice of Jesus in your ears, it brings freedom, but what else does it bring? It brings certainty. Certainty. It brings full assurance because his word of promise to you is certain and sure. It's true. It's permanent. This is why even the demons, (laughs) this is why even the demons collapsed under the word of the disciples. Demons question things. Demons raise doubt. Demons confuse words. Demons lie about God's word. When the word of Jesus comes to them, they are silenced because his word brings clarity and truth and most of all to us, comfort. Brings comfort to sinners like you and me. This is the deep impact that the gospel makes in our lives. And it is for the salvation of all who hear that our Lord Jesus Christ sends it into our ears. To the glory of Jesus, our Lord and Savior's name. Amen.